All right, so let's start again. So yeah, I'm gonna go through some of the uh, basic concepts and differentiation before moving on to my today's topic and uh, this week's topic, which is basically stem cells and uh, uh, plasticity of differentiation. But uh, I'm, I'm gonna take maybe uh, 10, 15 minutes to go through some basic concepts and differentiation, which I've already learned with the static. Um, so, and these are the learning objectives um, uh, for today's lecture. And I would like you guys to understand them by the end of the lecture. And if you don't understand it, just uh, ask me again and I can discuss it again. Uh, and please don't be shy, just stop me whenever you want, ask me questions. And I will also be asking some questions uh, from time to time. And I would really like you to participate because that will give me a, a hint that you are learning something. Otherwise, you know, I mean, I would like it to be more a discussion because you are senior guys and you should, you know, take full part, part participate fully into what I what we are learning here. So I would really appreciate if you, you know, go along with me and discuss it. So, yeah, uh, anybody care to tell me? Uh, answer this question. So how does a single cell give rise to 200 different cell types while keeping the same genetic material? So we have, you know, starting from the same genetic material, every cell has the same genetic content, but, or more or less the same genetic content with a couple of exceptions. Uh, but there are still more than 200 different cell types. Anybody? Any volunteers? So the cells are exposed to different morphisms. One of the reasons. Uh, exposed to different? Morphisms. Okay. And yeah. And what, what would happen when they are exposed to different mitogens? There will be some epigenetic changes. Yes. Yes. But in general, what, what, what happens to the overall um, uh, fate of the cell? Yeah. Cell fate is determined. Cell fate is determined by epigenetic changes. Yes. So, what I'm trying to, yeah, I mean, you are, you are, uh, all, uh, all of you guys are right. So, but I can, if I can sum up uh, in maybe a couple of sentences, is, is this um, uh, the gene expression program, which is governed by epigenetic uh, changes, that determines what kind of what type of cell or what, what kind of fate a cell is gonna adapt so this is the reason why um, so this uh, a, a particular type of for example uh, proteins are expressed because there is a particular gene expression program and that determines the fate of the cell so answer to this question very simply is that there are uh, uh, so, so every cell the answer is in, in one word, it's differentiation. But what is differentiation? It's because it's, it's a very specific gene expression program, which uh, produces a very specific set of proteins. And these proteins, they give a particular cell its identity. So 200 different types of cells, they have 200 different gene expression programs, which of course is determined by different extracellular factors, mitogens and epigenetic changes. But the, the core of the concept is that they have a particular type of gene expression program and they have a particular set of proteins that are expressed. And these two things, they determine uh, what kind of cell or what fate is, it's gonna adapt. Um, so yeah, uh, starting from one cell or very similar cells in the embryo, we eventually uh, go into a, a wide variety of cells, which again are dependent on gene expression program and a particular set of proteins expressed. Now, the question here arises, why do cells need to differentiate? What, what, what is the, what, what, why do you think that differentiation is required? There could be several answers to that, so. Please jump in. Why in the embryo? So embryo starts with very similar looking cells. In the blastocyst, 
their cells, most of the cells, they are uh, very similar looking, where they have very similar genetic program. But they, as the uh, embryo develops, they uh, differentiate into different cell types. The question is why? It's a very simple question. I mean, you can, you can answer it very quickly. As, uh, to um, give rise to different organs which can perform their functions? Yes. So there is a functional need. Very good. What else? What would happen if all the cells will do the same functions? So if you have 25 trillion cells, let's say, just an example, and all the cells will do everything, what would happen? So for example, they will uh, perform uh, kidney functions, they will perform the muscle functions, they will perform the neurons, all of the cells will perform the same functions. What would happen? Anybody? It's not really energy efficient in very simple terms, right? It's, um, so if all the cells, so there is a need for differentiation because when the cells grow from unicellular to multicellular, there is a need to, uh, you know, devolve the power and uh, have specialized cells doing specialized functions because if everybody, if every cell starts doing the same things, then uh, it will be a waste of resources and it's energy inefficient. So this is a very important concept in evolution that uh, the cells, when they go from unicellular to multicellular organisms, they uh, uh, basically divided the workload and. Um, and they, that's how they maintain, they, they manage to use the resources in a, in a very efficient way. Um, and how is it done? It's again, like I explained earlier, that it's a particular pattern of gene activity and uh, a specific, which leads to a very specific set of proteins that are synthesized. And uh, what happens during this uh, particular uh, or pattern of gene activity or at the molecular level, it's through transcription factors, extracellular molecules, and then epigenetic changes, including DNA methylation, histone, PTMs, variant histones. And uh, that's actually what is happening during this, this part, this, this particular pattern of gene activity. This, this is how it is controlled. So um, I think these are very fundamental concepts and I would really like you to understand why there's a need for differentiation uh, and how it's done. Uh, in the earlier stages of development, generally uh, the differentiation or the changes in gene expression or protein synthesized, it's a very subtle changes that occurs in the earlier stages of development. But, uh, but there are changes. So if you uh, compare the very early stages of embryo, different cells, they look alike, but they are, I mean, molecularly, or uh, if you analyze them using uh, high throughput methods, like RNA sequencing or different uh, DNA, different kind of DNA sequencing, their accessibility, their chromatin structure, they are, uh, there are subtle differences. And at this time, they are said to be committed but they are not yet differentiated. I will get to that concept later. And in the later stages of development, what happens is the cells are uh, differentiating very quickly and you start seeing uh, very overt kind of differences and the cells, they acquire a very stable state of gene expression and they are called terminally differentiated. So if you start with a, can you see my cursor? Yes, sir. So if you start with, uh, let's take an example of a blood stem cell and it starts differentiating into uh, a couple of progenitors. So at they, these two progenitors, they at this stage, they look alike, but there are definitely molecular differences between these progenitors. But then as the differentiation proceeds, they become morphologically, phenotypically, functionally, completely different cells. For example, the red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells, they are 
completely different kind of cells, keeping the same genetic makeup. And these changes are again because of, as we discussed earlier, the, so the mechanism is through a uh, specialized gene expression program and uh, through epigenetic changes. So that's the difference between early and late stages of development. <laughs> So like I explained earlier, that commitment and determination is the key. And um, uh, have you seen this Vedinkin's epigenetic landscape before? Have you seen this uh, image before? No, sir. Okay, so th this is a very kind of key concept in epigenetics. So this Weddington, Conrad Weddington was a developmental biologist in the 1940s. And at that time, he had no clue about the gene expression program, or he had no clue about epigenetics because at that time, not even the DNA structure was resolved. So, but he was uh, really interested, and he had he had he had this vision and the foresight that he devised these concepts at that time. That uh, so he devised an, a, a landscape. At that time, it was a developmental landscape, but then later it was adapted as an epigenetic landscape. So in terms of development, uh, what happens is that uh, if these marbles are going through these furrows, uh, they represent uh, the cells and uh, they go down these lanes or furrows and as they differentiate. So what happens is at every uh, bifurcation or intersection, they had a choice to make and that choice is usually a binary choice. So they have either or uh, choice between two different cell fates. So when once the development proceeds, what happens is this: these cells, they, for example, at this point, this marble can go is this way or this way. And so if it goes this way, then again, after a few cell divisions, it will again encounter another cell fate choice, and then it goes through different cell fates. And uh, at that time, he didn't really know about these. Uh, uh, you know, uh, epigenetics or histone modifications or how the gene expression program is regulated. But in developmental terms, this, these were his ideas, which were later proved to be quite right, actually, by uh, latest molecular biological experiments. And so if we simply kind of... Um, So if we summarize Weddington's landscape, developmental landscape, I would call it a developmental landscape. It basically has two implicit principles that the cell fate choices are binary in nature and they occur at these bifurcation points as the developmental or differentiation proceed. And uh, another important concept that is still not yet completely proven is that when the cells go through these it, it is our observation, we do not completely understand why, but it is our observation that most of the times, for example, this marble will, or this cell will go, will most uh, probably, and mostly it goes through this, to the, to the right side of the furcage furrow, but not on the left side. So this observation tells us that there is a predetermination. So even, at this earlier time point, there is a predetermination or commitment to this cell, cell, cell fate and not to this cell fate. And this was later actually observed by a very interesting experiment where um, some guys, they uh, uh, take out a hematopoietic progenitor cell and uh, when it divided, they took out the two daughter cells and grew them in exactly the same conditions. So for example, if you take out this uh, myeloid stem cell, as you can see here, and uh, once it's divided, you take the two daughter cells separately into uh, petri plates or to, uh, in, in cell culture, and you let them grow. What happens is in 80% of the time, what they observed is in 80% of the time, it always, uh, they always go into uh, red blood cells or platelets, for example. I'm just, just giving you an example. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that this cell fate, for example, the right side of, of the furrow is 
predetermined and 80% of the times the cell always go to this cell state. And, but only in 20% of the time cell goes to the other cell state. And this experiment was a very key experiment which tells us that the cell fates are predetermined. And this is something that uh, we do not understand completely why the cell fates are, are like this. So what, what predetermines that even at this stage, there may be some molecular signatures that are uh, governing the cell fate, which we observe later on, but yeah. So uh, uh, in differentiation, commitment and determination is the key. And this is very nicely explained by this Weddington's epigenetic landscape. And uh, later on, the Weddington's developmental landscape was converted into epigenetic landscape and which again, um, I mean, uh, basically you can adapt the developmental phenotypes into epigenetic uh, marks. So for example, if a, mar if a cell goes from this, from here to here, it acquires a particular set of chromatin marks. And uh, if it acquires a different set of chromatin marks, then it will go to this side. But again, like I said, that it is not completely understood uh, why uh, there is this predetermination. So, so the dif in differentiation, uh, you've already learned how the gene activity is established and maintained through epigenetics and uh, through extracellular signals. And uh, today we're going to discuss a little bit, go into the detail of the molecular basis of cellular differentiation, and we'll take an example of muscle cells and blood cells and a couple of other cell types. Uh, and in the Thursday's lecture, we'll cover the reversibility and plasticity of the differentiation state. Okay, uh, a couple of more slides. Uh, uh, have you seen this one, this experiment before, or do you? Guys? Have you been taught this the last days and SGS experiment before? I think we've gone through it, but if you can repeat it, that would be better. Okay. Yeah. So, um, what is what's very important to understand is that the the genes are transcribed, but there are regulatory regions that uh, governs the expression of these genes. And uh, the importance of this regulatory uh, region was uh, demonstrated very nicely by this experiment where. The scientists, what they did is so, so there is a mouse elastase gene and it has its own uh, promoter region or enhancer or control region. And then there is this uh, human growth hormone gene. So there are two different species, two different, completely different uh, uh, genes from the complete two different tissues. So this one is from pancreas and this one is from liver. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. So uh, what happens is uh, in this experimental setup, what they did is they changed the control region of uh, human growth hormone genes. So they put a, uh, they cloned in uh, the control region, the promoter region of the human elastase, of a mouse elastase gene together with the human growth hormone gene. And um, I can uh, also go into a little bit detail if you want, if you want to understand how this was done. but. Uh, yeah, it's, it's up to you. It's just tell me if you do not understand it. <laughs> so this is this was kind of a chimeric uh, uh, clone, clone where there is a control region, the promoter region of mouse elastase gene, and, and uh, then there was a downstream was a human growth hormone gene, and this was basically injected into a fertilized mouse egg, uh, which was enucleated. And uh, then the mouse uh, grew, and what happened was that the human growth hormone was the, the the mouse started making the human growth hormone from the pancreas. And why is that? Because what we did is we introduced the human growth hormone gene with the mouse elastase gene promoter, and the transcription factors that bind to this promoter, they are only expressed in the pancreas. 
And this was a very interesting experiment and uh, it proved that the regulatory regions of the genome determine its tissue specific expression. So if you put any gene here, uh, for example, from neuronal cells or from muscle cells and put a elastase one promoter, it will start expressing in the pancreas. Uh, and this basically highlights the importance of the regulatory regions of the genome. And if you, for example, remove the regulatory region of the genome, the expression ceases, even though the, the, the gene is still there and uh, yeah, unperturbed. So yeah, so there are different regulatory regions of the uh, genome. So uh, in the genome, so there are promoters, enhancers, repressors, co-activators, co-repressors. Um, and um, so, I will go come back to this uh, a little bit later. Um, yeah, in maybe next next couple of slides. But uh, you know, it's I mean, simply put, there is a gene and then there is a promoter. But then there are certain regulatory uh, elements that are a bit further from the gene. They are not right next to the gene itself. So, for example, promoter is most of the time. Uh, there are although some exceptions, but most of the time promote, the promoters are always next to the coding region of, of the gene. But enhancers are almost invariably, they are always away, further away from the genome and it requires certain chromatin structure in order to be close by, which I'm gonna discuss in the next, uh, next couple of slides. So, but I mean, what I want to stress here is that this, um, there is a whole, combination of uh, regulatory proteins, including transcription factors, including uh, co-activators, co-repressors, et cetera, et cetera. These, these are the factors. And there are general transcription factors and very specific transcription factors. There's RNA polymerase too. They, <coughs> they, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. they all combine and they all make a <coughs> complex in order for a particular gene to be activated. And uh, this drives development and differentiation. And this uh, combinatorial uh, pattern could be switched off or switched on through epigenetic modification. So if there is an epigenetic modification here, it will preclude binding of this uh, whole complex. And in this way, it, it can make the chromatin more compact. And in this way, it, it prevents binding of this uh, the whole complex or there are other modifications which basically compact this region, uh, coding region of the genome. And in this way, it, it basically physically hinders the movement of the RNA polymerase. So there are different, and there are, for example, DNA methylation that uh, hinders the binding of, for example, TF2D or other general transcription factors, um, because they have a very small binding motif. And if something happens to that if there is no space because of histones have occupied that space, it, it doesn't bind. So in this region, the promoter region needs to be free of any protein. And that's why there is always this nucleosome free region uh, just uh, at the transcription start site. And the, this, is, this is very important for the transcription of the gene that cells maintain this nucleosome free region. Anyway, so um, yeah, moving on. So what happens is, yeah. Um, so globally, if you look at uh, the global uh, chromatin structure, the gene expression is controlled by large scale mechanisms. I mean, it's, so what we have seen here is a very localized mechanism which regulates gene expression, but that's not the whole story. What happens is there are large scale mechanisms at place interplay which regulate a cluster of the genes because uh, it's usually uh, a set of genes like we discussed earlier that it's always a, a definite set of genes that are active in any given differentiated cell type. So these uh, genes they are usually clustered together because they have a, they need to be either repressed or they need to be activated. And this is generally governed by a large scale uh, chromatin structural organization. So uh, just to uh, go through with the, how the nucleosomes and how the chromatin structure is organized from very simple uh, nucleosomes bead on a string and into the nucleus where you see chromosomes or the chromatin loops. 
So what happens is, um, or what we have observed is there are different configurations of the chromatin. And uh, they are all present at the same time and uh, in different regions of the, of the, of the genome. So what happens is this uh, nucleosome feed on a string. So I'm pretty sure that you all know how nucleosome, what, what nucleosome is. You guys know what nucleosome is, right? There is yes. a combination, yeah. It's a combination of histone proteins and the DNA. That's what. Yeah, so there is 147 base pairs of DNA wrapped about around one and three quarters of a turn over eight histone proteins. So there are two molecules each of H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. And this makes one nucleosome. And there is, there are, there is a repeating array of nucleosomes. And then there, this part of the DNA, which is internucleosomal, this is called linker DNA. And there is also a linker histone here. But uh, so what happens is this beads on a string kind of appearance, it is folded upon each other in order to make these chromatin loops. And these chromatin loops are then separated by these uh, uh, structural proteins, CTCF and cohesins. And they have a very important role in um, uh, gene regulation because they demarcate this loop. And in this loop, there could be more than one gene which are governed by the same enhancers. I will come to that later. Uh, but yeah, so this uh, looping then is further kind of folded onto each other and form these topologically associating domains. Have you heard of topologically associating domains, Tad? Guys? You can say you, you can say yes or no. It's a very simple okay. question. Okay. So now uh, chromatin is looked upon as as a very dynamic structure and um, and uh, global organization globally organized in these topologically associating domains. These are called tabs. And in inside these tabs, there are these chromatin loops and uh, structures which are demarcated by this CTCF and the cohesins, the red and green proteins. Um, but the more, most important thing here is that these, all the genes that are present in this TAD, in each TAD, for example, they are, they have a similar level of expression. They have a, they have, they have two very important things. They have a similar level of expression and they have a similar replication timing program. I don't know if you know about replication, but I, I mean, I, I can discuss it later, but it's not very important right now. Uh, in developmental context, but uh, transcription is more important. So what you need to understand is that the TAD, each TAD, the, all the genes in each TAD, they have a very similar transcription program. And uh, so the chromatin is uh, globally organized into these TADs and these TADs, they are further organized into compartments. And uh, when you look at the, for example, this is the whole cell and then the bright yellow is the nucleus. And in the nucleus, if you look even under the light microscope, you see different bands of alternating light and gray sh uh, dark gray shades. Uh, and what these regions are, they are less dense and more dense chromatin. And basically compartment A refers to a more condensed form of chromatin, which you also know as heterochromatin. But nowadays, um, this euchromatin and heterochromatin terminologies are, are a little bit outdated. So people, I mean, people still use it, but I think that, I mean, uh, going forward, we should use the terms stats and compartments, chromatin compartments. So you can consider heterochromatin as compartment A, and then the euchromatin is compartment B. Um, so the more compact uh, tabs, they are present in the uh, compartment A, and then the more loosely uh, spaced tabs are present in the compartment B. Um, yeah, and uh, there are different uh, regions of the chromatin, for example, lamina-associated domains or nucleolar-associated domains. Uh, these are both these, they belong to the compartment A because they are more compact uh, chromatin. And then interspersed there is the U chromatin or the compartment B. And uh, the important thing here is that, uh, like I said, that there are many similarly expressing genes inside one TAD. And these regions, they interact with each other more often 
then they interact with the with another tad which is also i mean uh, very much visible because i mean the chromatin hair uh, it has a more frequent kind of folding onto each other than uh, chromatin in this tad so these two tads they are quite separate uh, and they are functional entities maybe for now you can they are uh, individual functional entities and they have a particular transcription uh, outcome and uh, maybe this is a little bit detailed but um, i think uh, maybe you should you, you guys should know a little bit about these methods because they are uh, nowadays they are quite mainstream and people study chromatin structure using this uh, 3c based method so this this is basically this chromatin conformation capture capture method and uh, they what they tell you is that if a given chromatin re so this is chromatin for example and this is one tad and this is another tad and like i said and then the color here it tells you the number of interactions within a chromatin domain so for example if the color is very bright red it means that the the two two regions here they interact very frequently with each other um and um yeah um so uh what's important here is that that there is a regulatory region for this tad and there is a regulatory region for this tad and these two regions are separate and they they are separated by like i told you earlier that they are separated by these cohesins and ctcf domain and this tad for example this topologically associating domain which is represented here for example this is uh, an open chromatin and this is a closed of more compact chromatin um and uh, uh what's important here is these boundaries so for example these these are the boundary elements these these are the boundary elements here and these boundary elements are very important to prevent the spurious transcription because if the boundary elements are not here present here what happens is that either this heterochromatic or more compact tad uh it grows into this euchromatic tad and uh, it makes it uh, heterochromatic or this uh, actively transcribing euchromatic tad will overgrow onto this heterochromatic tad and start then gene starts expressing in this one so it 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 is very important and it's very important in differentiation that these tads are maintained because uh, you can imagine that a lot of so there are let's say 22000 genes but only a uh, couple of thousand genes or a uh, few thousand genes are ex only expressed in one cell type and the rest of the genes they need to be heterochromatized or they need to be uh, compacted and they need to be repressed and this is basically one of the mechanisms is as you learned before that one of the mechanism is through epigenetic modifications this is i'm giving you another mechanism this is how at a more global level they are uh, being repressed so they are uh, packaged into one particular heterochromatic tad which makes one compartment uh, uh, a repressive compartment and then the genes that are that needs to be actively transcribed they are in a different tad and they are actively transcribing so it's it's uh, so these uh, ctcf and the um, uh, control elements uh, they the cohesins the boundary factors they are very important in demarcating the boundaries between the tads and uh, what happens in cancers is sometimes these boundary elements are mutated and uh, one region overlaps the other one and then some gene starts transcribing and these uh, enhancers for example uh, so the yellow uh, rings they are the enhancers and they start uh, uh, basically activating the genes in this region Okay, I think uh, this uh, I have is some enough. questions. Yes, yes, please. Sir, my first question is: What do you mean by interactions within the chromatin? Is it the enhancer and jo RQ? Is there some other interactions, or is it something else? Um, uh, 
वो वाली इंट्रेक्शन नहीं है दोज इंट्रेक्शन एज वेल बट बाई इंट्रेक्शन मीन द फ्रीक्वेंसी ऑफ वन क्रोमेट इन रीजन फेसिंग एन अदर सो इफ दे आर क्लोज टू ईच अदर दे आर मोर फ्रीक्वेंटली यू नो एनकाउंटर्ड इन दिस काइंड ऑफ एस एस दिस इज एन एस ए दिस एस एल्स यू दैट इफ वन रीजन इज इन प्रोक्सिमिटी टू एन अदर रीजन and molecular interaction is a different thing all right i will come to that this essay uh, it doesn't tell you that the enhancer is uh, activating or repressing uh, the gene it what it tells you is that uh, if an enhancer is close to this gene or not i mean then there are other essays which tells you if the enhancer is actually uh, regulating the gene expression but this essay this essay here it's a, it's a basically a chromatin structural organization assay so this assay tells you how the chromatin is globally organized and this assay tells you the frequency of one, x region with the y region uh, frequency of uh, interaction of one region with the x region with the y region and by interaction it means that how proximal they are i mean they could be physically interacting with each other like in case of uh, this uh, enhancer looping for example they are physically kind of now interacting with each other so these enhancers they are quite far away but they are uh, through the adapter or mediated proteins they are interacting with this uh, transcriptional complex and through the with, with the promoter in this gene but this assay it does not tell you uh, about the activity of the enhancers or activity of the promoters what it tells the only thing it tells you is that if one genomic region how close two genomic regions are any two chromatin regions are so this is all versus all so it tells you all chromatin regions versus all and that's why i mean this the, the this s is a high c is called um this s is called high c this images that you show see here and high c is the kind of the most advanced form of cc based methods which tells you uh, all interactions versus all interactions so you can uh take any genomic loci and see uh its interactions with all the genomes and then it gives you this kind of uh, mountain and it tells you that this particular genomic loci interacts with these loci more frequently and with these loci less frequently so for example if the loci is here it interacts within this tad more frequently and with this tad less frequently did i make myself clear Yes, sir. Thank you. So another okay. question that I have is yeah. that, yeah. so you mentioned the CTCF uh, that they're separating the chromatin loops. But in sir, you have not even mentioned that they are separating tads. So what are exactly separate. are CTCF and the cohesion? So, yeah, yeah. So uh, what? Yeah. So CTCF, they are in fact, so they are in fact loops inside here. inside the tads there are loops but ctcf is also demarcating the boundaries of the tads and cohesins i mean they are very large structural proteins and they uh, also including condensins and um, they not only uh, demarcate the boundaries of the loops but they also demarcate the boundaries of the tad itself so there are two different levels of regulation here um yeah because there are loops inside these tads and they are also regulated by ctcf all, all right time. so let's move on so now um, we'll take on to the differentiation during embryonic life and differentiation during adult life and we we'll take an example of muscle differentiation during embryonic life and then the differentiation of blood skin gut epithelial lining during the adult life um yeah i mean most people think that differentiation when we talk about differentiation uh the first thing that comes is embryonic development but um do you guys know that this is a is it, is it a, a embryonic process or do can you give me an example where differentiation is also happening in the adult life 
I think uh, our blood cells that are being made in the uh, bone marrow. This is a very good example. Yeah, we've gone through this before. Very good. So then the question is why there is need for differentiation in adult tissues? Anybody? Yeah, because the older cells, they eventually die and they need to be replaced. Yes, very nice. And why do they die? <laughs> of course, there is an aging process, but uh, okay, well, we can go come to that later. Um, so one cell type that is continually renewed is you've mentioned uh, hematopoietic or blood cells. Anything else that is continually renewed in the adult tissues? The skin cells. Yeah, what else? It was written in the previous slide actually. Skin cells and, and? Similar to skin, what is Muscles. the most similar thing in the uh, in the body with skin? So the muscle cells. No, 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 no. Muscle cells are not continually renewed. They could be renewed. We'll come to that. It's a more difficult or challenging process. But it's this epithelial cells, or mostly the gut epithelial cells. So the epithelium is very similar to the skin. It uh, it's just that it's not carnified or stratified on the top. So all the epithelium, epithelial cells which are lining the body cavities, they are continuously renewed in the body. And um, there are reasons why they are continuously renewed. For example, in case of uh, skin, so like the answer to the second question, in case of skin, for example, the skin is, yeah, we can discuss it later. Okay, let's, let's go to that later. Let's take this example of uh, embryonic muscle differentiation. And uh, I think you have uh, covered this a little bit with Dr. Tariq, but uh, maybe I can add a little bit more into here. So what happens is that the muscle cells, they are um, uh, differentiated from these uh, somites, the progenitor cells in the somites, in the myotome, in the embryo. And uh, they are, by the trans by the action of this homeo domain transcription factors PEX3 and PEX7, they are uh, initially differentiated into these myoblasts. Uh, so myoblasts, they are not yet differentiated, but they are committed. So this is a very nice example of what I was discussing earlier, this concept that the predetermination or commitment is the key to differentiation. So at this point, uh, the myoblasts are committed uh, cells and they uh, can only make muscle fiber. So they will either grow as myoblasts or they will be further uh, down the road, they can be uh, differentiated as muscle fiber because they are committed. And uh, so the progenitor cells in somites, they, by the action of these homeo domain transcription factors, they are converted into uh, myoblasts. And um, and then these myoblasts, they express certain myogenic factors. And the most important of this are, these are the myoD family of transcription factors. And these myoD family of transcription factors, they give this identity or they keep the identity of myoblasts. And of course they are, are further required for differentiation. But if the myoblasts uh, continually express the myoD, MIF5, MRF4, I mean, these MyoD family of transcription factors, they are not going to differentiate only because they express this MyoD family of transcription factors. So there is something else that is needed. If they express these MyoD factors, they will continue to grow as uh, myoblasts. So w w what is it then that is required to differentiate them uh, into um, this uh, muscle fibers. So that's, that uh, stimulus is basically if you retract or if you take out the growth factors, 
then they start differentiating into the or maturating into the muscle fibers. So the stimulus that you need to provide is basically an anti-stimulus. So you need to take off the cells from the growth factor. So you need to take out the serum, for example, and only then the differentiation can proceed. Otherwise, uh, these myodefamgio transcription factors, they are uh, enough for this predetermined state and they are enough for myoblasts to keep the, to keep cycling in, in as a myoblast. So what, what happens when you take out the growth factors is that they there is a switch from the, the myoD MIF5 and MRF4 transcription factors into myogenin. And myogenin is basically the maturating or differentiation factor that is that turns the myoblast eventually into muscle fiber. So what happens is the myoblasts they uh, change their morphology. They uh, uh, they align themselves uh, into these multinucleated myotubes, and um, which eventually make the muscle fiber. So each of these fibers, they are these multinucleated uh, myotubes. And for this to happen, you need to have the action of this myogenin. Um, so what's important here is. Yeah. So now let's go back to what we learned previously. That there is there are these TADs, so the topologically associating domains. There are these epigenetic marks, DNA methylation, histone variants, all this mechanism that governs the gene expression program. So what happens is that these myo D family of transcription factors they belong in one TAD because they need to be continuously expressed. So the cells. Uh, organize these genes into one TED. And they could be on different chromosomes, but uh, I mean, in, in, in interphase nucleus, as you, I'm sure that you know that in interphase nucleus, the chromatin is not in the form of chromosomes, it's in the form of chromatin, which is uh, a less organized form of, uh, of the genome. Chromosome is the highest organized and compact form of the, of the chromatin. So in the form of chromatin, in the less organized in the topologically associated domain, the cells, they aggregate all these uh, similar or required genes uh, into one TED. And that's how they control or they regulate the expression of these genes. And then what happens is when there is a switch from the myoD to myogenin, uh, there is a change uh, in the transcription initiation complex. You can, I, I will uh, tell you later uh, what happens molecularly what happens. But what is more most important here is that the path from the pro, these progenitor cells to a fully differentiated cell is uh, you need to uh, stop the cells from cycling. So you need to block replication, basically. You need to block the cells. Uh, uh, you need to block the cell cycle, basically in order for them to differentiate. So uh, so this is again, another important concept in differentiation that replication and differentiation, they are not compatible with each other. So you need to block one in order to achieve the other. And if you want to de-differentiate, if you need to go back from muscle fiber to myoblast, you need to activate the, trans uh, the, the replication, uh, the DNA replication, the cell cycle. Um, uh, we will go to that later, maybe in the next lecture when we discuss uh, different ways how there is a yeah, de-differentiation. But yeah, for now, yeah, it, the important thing is that uh, that the differentiation and replication or cell cycle they are not compatible with each other, and that's why most of the differentiated, fully differentiated cells they are called end cells. Do you guys know what end cells are? Anybody? Why do they, why are they called end cells? Anyone? Most of the differentiated cells are called end cells. Jagrain, you are sleeping or sleeping? 
Yeah, I think as the name suggests, they cannot differentiate any further. That's why they're calling. They yes, they. This is one aspect, but the uh, other aspect is that they cannot divide further. That's why they call they are called end cells. Uh, and there is a reason why they cannot divide. There's this uh, telomere, the size of the telomeres that most of these, for example, muscle cells, the size of the telomeres. So telomeres are the end of the chromosomes. And there's a telomere shortening after every cell cycle. And usually telomeres are wrapped around each other. Uh, let me try to use this. Uh, tablet, draw something. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, there was a, yeah. So in the end cells, the telomeres are uh, shortened to the till the end, and so that they are they cannot be further shortened. And uh, that's because we don't have in human cells we don't have the telomerase that increases the length of the telomeres. And telomeres are usually wrapped at the end; they are wrapped around each other in order to avoid. Uh, the end of the to expose in order to avoid exposure of the end of the DNA because end of the DNA if it is exposed what happens is it activates the DNA damage response because the cells consider that the DNA is broken and that's why the telomeres at the ends of the chromosomes they need to be wrapped around uh, themselves and with every cell cycle this uh, length of the telomere is shortened and when they arrive at the end or uh, fully differentiated cells, they cannot further divide because one of the reasons is also because they have they have uh, already used up all the uh, telomere that they have. They cannot further cut down the telomere. Anyways, so um, there are different aspects uh, of these end cells. Um, is the answer to the question that you asked earlier about why do cells, differentiated cells die? Um, why do differentiated cells die? Uh, one answer is yes, you're right. I mean, it's, I wasn't asking, I uh, wasn't expecting this answer, but I mean, in a way you are right because differentiated cells cannot divide further. So they cannot, they can either go back in differentiation, they cannot move far further. So they divide, but the uh, true answer or the real answer to that question is that, um, because so the all the differentiated cells they um, they they are exposed to a lot of stresses from the environment for example let's take an example of skin cells uh, skin is constantly exposed to the external environment and this is very harsh there is uv there is a lot of you know chemicals that are exposed to so the skin or I mean, we, we are clothes that are constantly rubbing off our skin and, you know, we wash our hands, wash our faces with chemicals and all that. So, I mean, our skin is constantly exposed to harsh uh, environment. And that's why nature has, you know, evolved this mechanism that there's constant, uh, you know, constant renewal of the epithelial, of the skin epithelial cells. If you take an example of blood cells, can anybody tell me why there is a need for, I mean, we can, we, we can go to that later. I have that question later. We can, we can discuss it later. Why there is a need for hematopoietic stems, hematopoietic cells to be renewed. But for skin, for example, one reason is that they are exposed to very harsh environment and that's why they are constantly shedded from the, from the top of surface layer. And that's why they are needed to be differentiated and moved up the ladder. 
Um, okay. All right. So this is just a detour, but um, I mean, in our next lecture, we will discuss it a little bit further in detail. There's um. So we were discussing here that how the progenitor cells from insomites they are um, uh, converted or they are differentiated into uh, a muscle fiber through different steps and through the action of a combination of different uh, transcription factors and uh, histone modifications, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and also by removal of the growth factors or removal of uh, uh, prevent them from cycling. And these are the different things that are required for differentiation. Uh, but what happens is, and we learned that these are the factors. So for example, the myoD family of transcription factors, the myogenin, these collectively, these are the transcription factors that are absolutely required for either predetermination or for differentiation of the, of the muscle fiber cells. Um, now imagine that you have a cell type called fibroblasts. So fibroblasts are the mesenchymal or the, um, you can call it connective tissue cells uh, that can give rise to, uh, I mean, they're precursors of different uh, cells, osteoclasts, osteoclasts, et cetera. Uh, and, but they also uh, secrete extracellular matrix that is required, that is beneath the epithelium. We will, uh, I will explain that when we discuss the epithelial lining. But fibroblasts are the connective tissue cells and they are completely different in their um, epigenetic makeup, in their phenotype from the skeletal muscle cells. But what happens is there was a very ingenious experiment that was uh, performed actually quite a la long time ago. And what they did was once the transcription factors for the muscle uh, differentiation were identified, what some scientists did were they um, uh, put these transcription factors, they expressed these transcription factors into fibroblasts. And uh, the way people do this usually is through retroviral vectors. So they, what they do is they take these uh, genes, they isolate the genes from, um, for example, mice or even humans, and then they clone them into retroviral vectors. And retroviral vectors, they have the ability to infect uh, any uh, cell and uh, integrate into the genome of the host cell. And uh, in this way, they also integrate the gene that they carry. So for example, if they are carrying the MRF4, MRF5, or MyoG genes, they, these genes would also be integrated into the host cell. And if fibroblasts are the host cells, what happens is uh, these MRF4, 5, and MyoG, they, they become integrated into the fibroblast genome. And once they are integrated into the fibroblast genome, they start expressing and you can imagine very well what happens when these uh, myogenic factors start expressing in the uh, fibroblasts. What happens is a phenomena called trans differentiation, when one fully differentiated cell type is converted into another. And this is what they've observed that by the expression of only these three uh, transcription factors, the fibroblasts are converted into skeletal muscle. They start expressing uh, the predetermination factors and the differentiation factors for skeletal muscle, and they are converted into muscle. And this phenomenon is called transdifferentiation. We will go to that, uh, discuss it in the next lecture, inshallah. Um, yeah, so a little bit uh, more into the, uh, how the muscle cells, embryonic muscle cells, or the precursors of muscle cells they are so myoblasts are converted into the fully differentiated muscles. And like I explained earlier that of course, this is because of some expression or particular set of expression of uh, transcription factors, but most importantly, it was because the growth of the cells was halted. So the cell cycle needs to be arrested. And um, uh, have you guys learned these cyclins or cell cycles in cell biology? I guess. Yes, sir, we did study them. Okay, all right. So uh, I will not go through uh, too much into the detail of the cell cycle, but you, you know that there are different phases of cell cycle and then there are different cyclins and cyclin dependent kinases that are active in different phases. And what happens is that the differentiation of muscle cells, it requires withdrawal from the replication. And it's also reversible. 
and uh, usually in in the myoblast what is happening is that the cyclin depending kinases they uh, phosphorylate the myo dna five transcription factors and mark them for degradation and in this way the cells manage to keep cycling um, but once they give the once they get this uh, message of um, uh, differentiation or uh, Uh, once they need to differentiate what happens is they need to uh, activate this cyclic cdk12 inhibitor pdp21 for example or there are other mechanisms also but they need to arrest the cell cycle and one of the most efficient ways to arrest the cell cycle is through this cdk12 inhibitor p21 so myod and myod uh, they start activating the p21 when they get a signal to differentiate and uh, then there are also a lot of details what signals them to differentiate i i don't think that we will we should go into that but because here we are discussing this uh, in the context of development and differentiation not in a context of molecular biology so i will not go into the um, detailed molecular pathways how where the signal comes from but but there are different the extracellular signals that basically uh lead to the activation of p21 and which leads to cell cycle arrest an independent uh, pathway is that the myod uh, family of transcription factors they block the phosphorylation of re retinoblastoma protein by cdk4 so cyclin and kinase 4 and retinoblastoma protein phos phosphorylation of retinoblastoma protein is very important for uh transition from g1 to s phase and um so if you block this uh, transition uh, you eventually lead to cell cycle arrest and then the most important thing that happens um at the more global level is that i mean we discussed about the tad so all these um, genes that are required for muscle differentiation they are in one tad because their expression needs to be coordinated and uh, so in that context context it is in, uh, easy to understand that there is a change in the full uh, core transcriptional complex um from tf2d to into this uh, trf3 and taf3 so the whole transcription factor complex initiation complex that is active in the myoblast that keeps them cycling that is uh replaced by this um uh, trf3 and taf3 and um uh, it starts expressing the myogen in gene and uh decrease the expression of probably myog and myod and in this way i mean of course there are a lot of other steps involved but here what i want to give you i mean conceptually what happens is that there is a change in the core transcriptional complex and this leads to activation of the myogenin um yeah so like we discussed about the trans differentiation there is also i mean de differentiation can also occur and we will also discuss it later when we discuss about uh, some stem cells induced pluripotent stem cells but for now uh, what i want to tell you is that the differentiation is a very plastic process it's and by plastic i mean it's a, it's a more dynamic process so you can differentiate and you can also de differentiate although it's um, the efficiency of de differentiation or uh, the frequency that it happens in nature it's it's very rare at least in mammals and in humans but it it can happen uh, so the differentiation state of the cell it's not a very uh, fixed or permanent state it is a stable state though but it's not a fixed or permanent end point so uh, but and and what happens during de differentiation is that the cells need to re enter into cell cycle so they need to start activate these cyclin dependent kinases and the cyclins in order to re enter into the cell and this occurs during regeneration and some human tissues they have a limited ability to for regeneration but generally it happens in uh, low vertebrates um so the muscle cells they are end cells like we discussed earlier that they 
do not further differentiate, they do not further divide. And that's why they are called n sub. But can they be replaced? Can they be replaced? Anybody? If you damage your, yes, please. Um, so I have a question. So you mentioned that the CDK is going to phosphorylate the MyOD and then it's going to cause its degradation. Mm -hmm. But how does that uh, MyOD uh, escape that phosphorylation? Because then you said that there's this change in the core transcription complex and that activates the MyOG. So I'm kind of confused because that's kind of a post transcription, yeah. like it's a post translation modification that's the phosphorylation. And that the other thing that that's activating MyoG is basically the transcription that's that come that happens before the uh, post translation modification. So I'm still confused in that bit. So this first part is what is happening in the myoblast. But when myoblast starts, when they decided that they want to differentiate into uh, the muscle fibers, then this the next three steps starts happening. So the first step, this is usually happening during the, so the expression of MyoD and MIF5, they are kept low, not completely eliminated. And this degradation pathway is also, it's not fully established, or I would say not fully demonstrated, but it's probably uh, marked them for this phosphorylation, probably marked them for degradation. But again, I mean, it is uh, in the myoblast, they need MyoD and MIF5 because otherwise they will not keep their identity or they will not keep their predetermined state. So they need a uh, degree of the MyoD and MIF5 uh, expression. And, uh, but uh, if you have an overexpression of MyoD and MIF5, then it probably uh, pulls the cell towards differentiation and it inhibits, then, the, then it activates uh, P21. So that's probably there is a balance between CDK dependent phosphorylation of MyoD and MyoD dependent activation of P21. And when the signals arrive, when the cells need to differentiate, then the balance is shifted towards the P21 activation. And this becomes you know, less active. Okay. Did I, did I make myself clear? Yeah, thank you. So yeah, so there is always, I mean, it's not an absolute, when I say degradation it's or activation, it's not an absolute, in, a, in absolute terms. There is always a balance in the cells. There is always uh, a balance between different transcription factors and in different uh, molecules which compete with each other. And this is actually a very uh, interesting strategy that we use uh, in molecular biology when we manipulate expression of the genes. We use, um, a uh, dominant negative competitor of a protein, for example. So if you want to com uh, inhibit the binding of this transcription factor to this region of the DNA, you, one strategy, I mean, uh, in the lab, in the laboratory-based setting, what you do is you make a, a mutant of this uh, factor, of this transcription factor, so the TF2D, which can still bind to this DNA, but it does not bind to the RNA polymerase. So then what would happen is that that mutant TF2D that will compete with the actual or the cellular TF2D uh, for this binding site. But uh, since we overexpress in the cells quite large number of um, by retroviral expression, quite uh, high amount of this we've supplied quite high amount of uh, this TF mutant 2F2D, TF2D. It competes um, uh, with the endogenous TF2D and binds, always binds to this uh, more efficiently than the endogenous one. And then in turn, it blocks transcription. So this is actually, so th th this is an example of how a competition can be, you know, used in molecular biology setting. And, it also tells us there is, there is always a, uh, a competition between different molecules and there is a balance between different molecules. It's, there is no absolute absence or presence. All right, so how are the muscle cells replaced? Can you guys imagine that they can be replaced or can they be replaced? What is your observation? 
if there is a injury to the muscle is it possible to regenerate a new muscle what happens if you have an injury on the skin for example sorry so the skin can regenerate and skin can cover up but can you say the same for muscles anyone okay yeah the short answer is yes muscles can regenerate but there is a very big but here it's not very efficient and in human cells in human muscles it's not very frequent and we will come to that later but yes there are stem cells which uh, lead to you know uh renewal of your end cells what you can call uh be it a uh, muscle cells or uh, or a neuron or you know epithelial gut epithelium skin etc muscles so there is a very limited capability in some uh, tissues there is a quite high capability for example in hematopoiesis or skin there is a very high capability to to uh, replenish or renew uh, the end cells but in others for example the neurons and muscles there is a very very limited capability so uh, and i'll come to that later towards the last section of my talk today just a moment sorry um yeah so stem cells what do you guys understand by stem cells i mean it's a very uh, popular and very fashionable word stem cells anybody just give me a couple of words what do you understand by stem cells just a layman i mean it's it's not a an examination you don't have to be very perfect in your answer anybody so an yeah. cells and uh, you can uh, the, any kind of cells can be made from these yeah very good very good so stem cells are basically the body's raw material and you can you know you can compare them to the embryonic cells because they have this potential or they have this capability to develop or grow into uh any kind of cell uh if there is a need uh talking about in adult life but in of course there is a definite need in the embryo that cells need to be stem cells they need to be differentiated into multiple cell types but yeah but the basic uh, uh kind of definition of stem cells is that they are the really at the uh, uh bottom of the pyramid so you can uh grow these cells into any number of uh, uh, differentiated or very specialized cell types under the right conditions and you can also do it just hold on please ji assalam alaikum main the lecture le raha hu main aapse 1 ghante baad baat karta hu okay no um yeah so so there are different type of stem cells and we will go through them uh, most of them uh, individually and we will also learn differences between them um so yeah so there are embryonic stem cells there are adult stem cells there are these induced pluripotent stem cells perinatal stem cells um one kind of the basic property of the stem cells is their so that that they can differentiate into many cell types and the second one is their uh, self sustainability so what do you mean by self sustainability um so 
So Kanza asked me a question that these stem cells are undifferentiated. Yes, so the stem cells, they're, by definition, they are undifferentiated cells. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. Thank you for, uh, you know, jumping in. Um, so these, the, the stem cells, like I said, they are the base of the pyramid and they are undifferentiated by definition. And that's why they can be differentiated into many cell types. And uh, uh, answer to your question, uh, Mamina, uh, you, you asked if they, what, what does it mean by self-sustainability? Self-sustainability means that they can keep their own population intact. And what does that mean? I will come to that later, but um, it's a very important um, part of the talk today. So you can call, also call it self-renewal. And that's a very uh, inherent property, just like undifferentiatedness does this other property, the self-renewal uh, nature of the stem cells is very important for their own sustainability. Um, and then there are different types of adult stem cells. There are these hematopoietic stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, neural epithelial skin, different types of adult stem cells. And, um, yeah, I think uh, you can from uh, the, these two, they are uh, there's kind of, they are self-explanatory. So embryonic stem cells, they're from embryo. Then there are adult stem cells that are from the adult tissues. And then there is this special category called induced, or oh, maybe let me first describe this. So the perinatal stem cells, they are from the umbilical cord. So when the baby is born, then there's this, uh, so the babies are joined with the placenta with the mother through this umbilical cord and through which they get their nutrient supplies, et cetera. So uh, recently, I mean, not very recently, but uh, I mean, uh, not long ago, it was uh, recognized that this umbilical cord, it also has this, uh, they also have this embryonic stem cell population that can be used. Uh, further. And this is actually a very important um, uh, consideration. And now in many countries, what they do is they keep this umbilical cord, portion of this umbilical cord uh, frozen somewhere uh, in uh, liquid nitrogen when, when, when the baby is born so that they keep this uh, potential uh, material for later research use or for maybe for therapeutic use for that person. Because uh, these cells are for the from the same baby, and they can be, you know, very easily used for, uh, you know, to be used as uh, to 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 be grown in laboratory, and then they can be used uh, to trans for transplant and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I can explain that later. But yeah, I mean, so the, this perinatal stem cells, they are uh, nowadays. I mean, it's. Uh, in some Western countries, it's also possible to ask them to save these uh, perinatal stem cells for the baby. So now, what what is induced pluripotent stem cells? Anybody? Have you heard this name before, iPSCs? Yes or no? There is no wrong or right answer here. Okay, I take it that you haven't heard. So the iPSCs, they are, I mean, by the name indicates that these are the induced pluripotent stem cells. You can induce the stem cell function. So I will go back to this de-differentiation, what we discussed earlier, that in, in the muscle, in the context of muscle cells, it's possible to de-differentiate. And it's actually now uh, possible uh, by some very fancy manipulations in the cells. It's possible to basically de-differentiate um, or induce the pluripotent uh, potential in any specialized cell type. And we will discuss that later. Yeah, so now let's take an example of, um, uh, you guys need five minutes break or I, um, I completely forgot to ask you. Is it okay or we, we will finish in half an hour, but if you want a break, we can also have a five minute break. So, 
Shall we continue or take five? Sir, I guess we should take a break. Okay. Let's take a break. Um, anybody, if you, if you have a question, I'm here. Let's resume at 11.35. Um, excuse me, sir. हाँ जी. Sir, आप ये वाला point दोबारा समझा सकते हैं जो आपने बताया था कि CDKs जो होते हैं, they phosphorylate myoid and degradation. उस पहले दो steps से if you can repeat those. Okay. Yes. And share my screen. Okay, so what I was saying is that yeah, it's a little bit confusing here. Uh, I mean, it was yeah. I'm sorry for that. So what happens is what normally happens is if you forget about the lower part, let's say 
if you only consider this part, this is what is happening from in the myo in the myoblast in this earlier committed but undifferentiated cells. This is how um, the cell cycle, the cells are keep cycling. That they keep the myoD and MIF5, the, this myoD family of transcription factors, uh, at lower levels. They do not, they are not completely eliminated, but they are kept at lower levels. And these low level, this low level is required for two purposes. Low level is, I mean, their expression is required for keeping the myoblast, myoblast as a predetermined or uh, committed in a committed state, but it also uh, kind of serves the purpose. I mean, this low level of MIF5 and myoD in the myoblast serves the purpose that they do not immediately differentiate. Because if there are high levels of myoD and MIF5, this would happen. There are high levels of myoD and MIF5. What happens is that they start activating the P21, which is the cell cycle inhibitor. So it's a, it's a CDK inhibitor. So it leads to cell cycle arrest. So in the myoblast, until the signal came for differentiation, they keep uh, the myoD and MIF5 at lower levels. And in this way, they keep their identity as myoblast because they are still expressing these myoD family of transcription factors. But at the same time, they are also keeping themselves in cycle, in the cell cycle. So once the signal comes for differentiation, what happens is that the myoG and myoD, they come out of this, uh, or they start activating P21. And when they start activating P21, or they start inhibiting this phospho-RB, what happens is it leads to cell cycle arrest. I mean, there's, of course, there is a signal in between. There is another signal, which is not mentioned here, which is not necessary for, for now, but there is a signal, there is a differentiation signal that comes from extracellular matrix, for example. And that signal basically uh, leads to stabilization of myoD and MIF5 and leads to activation of P21 or inactivation of RB. But until then, this is what's happening. So this is what is happening that the myoD and MIF5, they are kept at low level. When the signal for differentiation comes, these two things happen. All right, sir, I got it. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so we can, the problem here is that my computer's laptop's battery is only 4% left. I need to, let me connect to the other laptop and um, there is a weaker connection there, unfortunately, but let's try. Give me a couple of minutes. Thank you. direct living for a living. Yeah. 
मेरी प्रेजेंटेशन इसमें कैसे ट्रांसफर होगी यार ये जो मसला है ना चलो मैं ट्राई करता हूँ इसके अंदर अगर तो इंटरनेट सही चलता रहे तो क्योंकि अब प्रेजेंटेशन तो उसमें बड़ी है अब कोई यूएस बी चाहिए या कोई चीज चाहिए जैसे है यूएस बी चलो मैं एक मिनट ट्राई कर लूँ ये यू एस बी ड्राइव है ओके एक पार्टी हो गए मेरा ख्याल है कि रिज्यूम करते हैं वो एंड करते हैं आज का लेक्चर ओके गाइस आई हैव सम इंटरनेट इश्यूज एंड आई थिंक लेट्स टेक द रेस्ट ऑफ द लेक्चर नेक्स्ट टाइम इज इट ओके Okay, sir. Um, sir, can I ask one thing? Um, so the link that you shared for today's lecture is it a recurrent uh, uh, link? No, no. Next time it... I will I will share another another link. It's not. All right. Recurrent. In that case, can you please include my email ID as well? Because my email ID is not included in that one, and that's okay. why I missed a little okay. uh, like a few minutes earlier. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can Sorry send your that. email as well. So. Yes. Thank please so send much. me. Yeah. Okay. All right. So see you guys on Thursday. Um, sir. Um, yeah, yeah. Sir, kindly share the recording as well. Okay. All right. We'll do that. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Allah all right. Allah face. Allah face.